Okay. Okay. We're back. It's 2004, the International Year of Rice. Confessions Part 2 is at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. An early version of Facebook is infesting Harvard University campus, and Spaceship One has just become the first commercial craft to achieve spaceflight. In the West Coast United States, though, people are playing fighting games. The Evolution Championship Series is enjoying its sixth annual convention, though only its third by that name, in a university in Southern California, where 700 warriors from over 30 different countries are battling it out using moves to see who is the best at fighting games. Which fighting games? I'm glad you asked. Exhibiting at this year's EVO, we have Street Fighter 3 The Third Strike, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 New Age of Heroes, Soul Calibur 2 Tekken 4, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, Tekken Tag Tour, Virtual Fighter 4 Evolution, Guilty Gear X2 The Midnight Carnival, Capcom vs. SNK 2 Mark of the Millennium 2001. Wow! And what a tournament these Seekers of the Fist have ahead of them. You can always expect the best from the Evolution Championship series. Why, in that hall over there, a poorly executed prize split in the Soul Calibur 2 finals is about to change the rules of engagement forever. Upon closer inspection, it turns out there really is nothing in the book that says you have to actually play the game. Who knew? But this year's fight finders have no idea what's coming. Because in the tournament bracket for Capcom's 1999 fighting game, Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, history is about to be made. In a sweaty university hall in SoCal, a single game event is about to launch a thousand ships, loosen a thousand wallets, and change the world. In a very real way, esports is about to be born. This day, this game, this fight, are so powerful they'll live forever. Immortalized by the words, Evo Moment 37. What? That can't be right. To understand what makes the Evolution Championship Series such a big deal, we need to look at the numbers. I told you that this year's tournament had 700 entrants, which might not seem like that many, but let's look again. If you're from the distant future where EVO gets over 5,000 entrants for one game, then this might seem small and irrelevant. But right now, in 2004, it's as big as fighting games get. This is where you go to test your mettle against players from all walks of life. In attendance at EVO 2004 are national champions from everywhere in the world. This was the before time, before netplay. Unless any national champions happened to play at your local arcade, this was the only chance you'd get to dust your knuckles with the best of them. And yes, 700 people could probably fit into one pixel of the footage of the crowd at the Dota 2 Invitational. But EVO is an open tournament, which means that to this day, on the world stage of fighting games, you can just walk in. You don't need to be a professionally coached team of 19-year-olds sponsored by a car insurance company, or qualified via an international league subsidized by a multi-billion dollar media corporation in order to win the most prestigious fighting game tournament in the world. You just need to bring a controller and pay your entry fee. This is what makes EVO so special. Its very core is built around the way of the warrior. You're here to see fighting games played the best that they can be played, and to show others your skill. You might even see the world's mightiest warriors in the bracket, catch some world-renowned hands, feel the graze of their knuckles against your ribs on their way to greatness. If you go to see the best people in the world play Street Fighter, they're speaking a language you understand. Their feats of greatness are all the more accessible to you because when you go home to your arcade cabinet or Dreamcast, you can try them out yourself. That's just a Chun-Li versus a Ken up there. One day, you could be that Ken. You could be that Chun-Li. But here today, it's not just any Chun-Li. Justin Wong is not just a killer. Justin Wong is one of THE killers. He's already won EVO this year, in Marvel vs. Capcom 2. He also won it last year. And the year before that. And the year before that. He'll go on to win it three more times. His technical skill is outstanding. He was forged in the fires of Marvel. Can you imagine a world where children can do infinite combos? Justin Wong was born in that world. He crawled his way into being in that world kicking and screaming, fighting for his right to live, his right to play. That may be a different game, but learning a new game is all practice. The real transferable skill here is winning. How and when to push your luck, outwit your opponents, and keep your cool when the stakes are as high as they can possibly be. Justin Wong knows all about that. 
He made his bones in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, a game about consistently and carefully subjecting your opponent to tides of totally ridiculous bullshit. You play a fast-paced and frenetic footsies game, tempting your opponent to overextend themselves. Then once you have your advantage, you press it. And then you press it again. And then you press it again. And again. And again. And again. Until either the game makes you stop, or your opponent throws their controller at you in rage. And it just so happens that Justin has found himself in a familiar situation. He is on match point, his opponent's life bar is functionally empty, he has plenty of life of his own, and super meter to boot. Victory is only a moment away. It's time to press his advantage. And against almost everyone in the world, that's a solid plan. But this is EVO Top 8. You don't get to play against just anyone else. Sometimes you have to play against internationally renowned warriors. And sometimes you have to play against Mr. Street Fighter. Now, fight a new rival. Select the one to fight with. Get it on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Pick and choose the right one. Get it on. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeah. Select the one to fight with. Get it on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Yes, sir. Pick and choose the right one. Get it on. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Daigo Omehara is a force of nature. He is among the most decorated fighting game players of all time, with national wins in multiple Street Fighter games, Vampire games, and Guilty Gear games. He hasn't come to today's tournament with a three-win streak to keep up, but he did win EVO twice last year. Yes, he was the Evolution Champion for Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo and Guilty Gear XX at the same time. His skill across the spectrum of 2D fighters is dizzying, and has even led some to call him the god of 2D fighting games. Daigo's face is burned into the memory of the American fighting game scene. Ever since the 1998 Street Fighter Alpha 3 International Grand Championship where he defeated America's champion, Alex Valle, in front of a then brand new worldwide audience. And since then, he hasn't stopped. Championship after championship, trophy after trophy, he just keeps coming. Every time someone says Daigo Umehara is washed up, he comes back stronger, back to drag and punch the teeth out of another generation of new blood. As of 2019, he has had a tournament fighting game career spanning 23 years. Right now, it's 2004, and we're only in year 7. Daigo is a habitual winner, a champion, and an international grandmaster. But in the eyes of some, he's not legendary yet. And maybe he knows it, maybe he doesn't. But he's about to be. The last critical piece of this story, the part of this mess that has the following 30 seconds reverberating through the whole hall and into the hearts of every single attendant, is baked into the core of the game itself. It is the mutant gene in the DNA of Street Fighter 3 Third Strike that takes what was a wholesome, clean, and deep game and warps it into something dangerous, something wrong. The last ingredient is the parry. Fighting games are, at their core, not like other games in which you inspire instant death in your opponent by depleting the bar in their corner of the screen. Pokemon, for instance, establishes a rhythm in which the fastest Pokemon goes first, and then you take turns. The depletion of health and subsequent death is forced upon you. In a symmetrical scenario, you cannot avoid it. Pokemon encounters are a desperate struggle to die last. But Street Fighter teases the idea with the player of blocking. By holding the joystick away from your opponent, it hints, you can prevent damage from your opponent's dragon fists and lightning legs. Only when moving forward and attacking are you vulnerable. This, by the way, renders all life loss in Street Fighter deliciously consensual. But this isn't the full picture. At some point in the development of Street Fighter, it became clear that some enemy eyes or even human opponents had a propensity to get ahead on life and then just block forever, being awarded the win when the clock hit zero and starting the grand tradition of the timer scam in fighting games. To limit this, a change was made. Blocking would no longer negate all damage from an incoming special attack, instead reducing it to a small fraction of its original value, called chip damage. This way, a player is not able to win a street fight by declining to fight in the street. Fast forward 12 years to Third Strike, however, and things have changed. In Street Fighter 3's brave new world, defense is offense, offense is easily defended by offensive defense, and nothing makes sense. This world is the world of the parry. The parry is easily the best and worst thing about Third Strike. 
Like many truly great mechanical designs, it killed the game that featured it and made lifelong obsessives of everyone who survived. The thing about blocking is that it becomes about safety. In holding the joystick away from your opponent to reduce incoming damage, you begin to shut down. By holding away, you're mentally, sometimes literally, retreating from the fight. You cling for dear life as you hold down back. The parry takes this passive state of damage reduction and makes it proactive. By timing your parry to the exact moment of your opponent's attack, you negate it completely, spending no resources, taking no chip damage whatsoever, and briefly freezing your opponent. This is even true of characters' super arts, allowing you to negate orbs of roiling plasma with a flick of your wrist. A player who is able to properly parry is functionally invincible. And the kicker is that this is not done by pulling the joystick away from your opponent. You don't gently tap backwards on the stick. You don't attack so your strike meets theirs. You parry by tapping forward. This means that the fail case for not making that six frame window, which, let's remind ourselves, is one tenth of a second, is just getting hit in the face. You forsake the safety of blocking entirely to parry. To successfully parry your opponent's attack in third strike is to so profoundly disbelieve your opponent's offense that it evaporates completely. To assert your interpretation of events over theirs with such conviction that reality itself breaks to accommodate you. It's a credit to the sound designers for Third Strike that the sound effect for the parry manages to stand out in a game made to be played on a noisy, muddled arcade cabinet. Here's what a low-level game of Third Strike sounds like. This is the sound a parry makes. Almost no other sound in the game operates on this register. When you score a parry, you will know about it instantly. Everyone standing by the cabinet will know about it instantly. If you can hook up the tournament standard arcade machine supergun to a sound system, everyone in the hall will know about it instantly. The parry, from the judgment it implies to the sound it makes, is our final ingredient. You might ask, as Reddit user Guitar Arvin once did, what's the point of attacking if they can just parry? To which I would respond, as Reddit user OSNotFound once did, what's the point of living if we're all just going to die? Fighters ready, engage! Though the video you'll find on YouTube is about a minute long, the white-hot core of EVO Moment 37 lasts roughly 10 seconds. In fighting game terms, that's 600 frames. That's long enough for Ken and Chun-Li to whiff exactly 25 jabs each. It's long enough for Chun-Li to taunt 10 times, gaining a terrifying array of bonuses as she does so. It's enough for a typical hummingbird's wings to beat 800 times. All of this is to say that 10 seconds is a long time in fighting games, and that hummingbirds would probably be pretty good at them. If you've ever seen EVO Moment 37, you'll know it begins here. Justin as Chun-Li is sitting on a pretty cozy lead while Daigo as Ken is staring down an empty life bar. If he even blocks now, he's doomed. Chip damage will see to that. The crowd are loving it. Seth Killian on commentary remarks that this is rare footage of Daigo actually angry. And a voice from the crowd cries, Let's go, Justin! As if suddenly inspired, Justin takes the shot. He spends his meter and we see the ominous blue flash of a third strike super. And this is not just any super, this is Chun-Li's super too, the Hoyoku Sen. Probably one of the best supers in the game, it launches Chun-Li across the screen, kicks the opponent 17 times in 2 seconds, and launches them into the air with multiple follow-up options. But Justin doesn't care too much about these things right now, because every single one of those 17 kicks does enough damage on its own to kill Daigo where he stands. If even one finds its target, the game is over and Justin has won. But the unfortunate truth is, at the very frame his super flashes, Justin is already dead. He just doesn't know it yet. Because EVO Moment 37 doesn't actually begin with this flash. It begins a few frames before, with this neutral game that Daigo is playing. The key is in these steps here. Daigo is a creature of discipline and practice. He's been training long and hard to deal with Chun-Li's Super 2. He knows that because of the way the game freezes during the Super Flash and Chun-Li launches forward. He needs to be in what's known as parryable frames when the flash goes off in order to make the first parry, and continue on his journey into the history books. He does this by simply walking forward, so that when Justice Super freezes the game, it will store his forward input and allow him to parry, rather than storing his backward input and allowing him to be dead. It's an action so tiny that it's often not even considered part of the play. But it's the bullet that kills Justin Watt. Everything else is just travel time. But let's go back to the Flash. The whole hall sees it and they know it's over. They don't even really react. This action is cool, it's clinical. Justin is pressing his advantage. The game is just over. For the crowd, this is the death blow. Daigo's tournament run ends here. Justin lunges across the screen, exactly as expected. Looks like this game's tied up. And then this happens. If Daigo shuffling forward into parryable frames is the bullet that kills Justin, this first parry is the muzzle flash. 
An unmistakable sight and sound that signals the end of Justin Wong. But nobody in the room will be sure of that until sometime afterwards, having scooped their jaws off the floor and their brains from the nearby walls. Daigo, on the other hand, has already outlived expectations, but he has a mountain left to climb. A mountain made of kicks. And he parries them. One, two, three, four, five, six. For a total of seven continuous parries. Seven death blows negated. This is when people start screaming. The energy in the room goes up by a factor of ten. With the flat of his hand, Daigo is breaking the world before their very eyes. They don't even know what they're seeing yet. There's a gap, a break in the rhythm for Daigo to drop his next input, but he doesn't. Seven more parries. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everyone yells again, louder this time. And then Daigo does something wicked. Chun Li still has a kick on deck, and Daigo still has to parry it. He could parry it standing. He doesn't. He jumps in place and parries it in mid-air, and in so doing, positions himself perfectly for an extra damaging jumping combo. Daigo falls on Justin Wong like a grand piano falls on a tangerine from a ten-story building, only much quieter. The sound in the room is amazing. These people have seen history made before their very eyes in too short a time for anyone to even realize what's going on. When people talk about what makes fighting games watchable, myself among them, they'll almost always use the word hype. This is a difficult word to pin down, but I'm lucky, because I don't have to try and describe it to you with English words. I can just tell you that when people say a game is hype, what they mean is this sound, recorded from a university hall in Southern California, crystallized in a video cassette tape made in 2004. This is the sound of the course of history changing forever, twice in less than six seconds. Okay, I have to get something out of the way here. This play is not just a showing of huge mental fortitude. It's also a stroke of genius. While performing 14 six-frame inputs in a row, jumping, then performing another, dancing on a knife edge the whole time, Daigo notices Justin's health bar. I did my best to recreate the exact life totals at the event, and I tried to replicate Daigo's combo. It took me a while, third strike is hard. But here's the thing. I did some rough calculations, and at the time of Evo Moment 37, Justin Wong had something like 60 or 65 life left. With no other bells or whistles, Ken's Shippu Jinrai Super only does about 43 damage. The best standing punish I could think of does 59 damage. If you miss the crouching medium kick link, this combo doesn't kill. Daigo's combo does 68 damage. It was all necessary, all of it. From the shuffle forward to the jump to the dragon punch cancel. It wasn't just one of the most stylish things anyone has ever seen or will ever see in Street Fighter. It was also the only way to win. That is Evo Moment 37. In the span of just over 10 seconds, Daigo Umehara, with a single breath left in his body, completely dismantles Justin Wong's overwhelming offense and creates from nothing the time to perform a counterattack that kills Justin for daring to have tried. Before writing this, I watched that video regularly, and in the process of this production, I've watched it many times more, sometimes with the audio off, sometimes frame by frame, sometimes listening out really hard for commentary asides I still can't really hear. And yet even now, I'm not ashamed to admit it makes me cry. Because that's what lies at the heart of all fighting games, that Daigo knew unwaveringly a certain death barreled towards him on that day. 
It's no tragedy that he will one day die, because for every second of every minute between now and then, he gets to live. Despite what you might think, the brilliant light of this moment didn't blast Justin off the face of the earth. He felt it, for sure, and he went out of the tournament. But the truth is neither he nor Daigo won the event. Victory that day went to Kenji Obata, a powerful Yoon player. Not only was this his second consecutive Third Strike EVO title, he had in fact beaten Daigo in this exact matchup to win the championship 12 months ago. After this, Daigo and Justin just went home and resumed being extremely successful fighting game players. In the coming years, between them, they will go on to win nine more EVO titles, and each will solidify their legendary status in the canon of fighting game players. Justin will establish absolute dominance in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, right through to the very end of that game's life, with his contemporaries remarking that he was the only person capable of performing that game's most advanced techniques. Daigo will continue to claim championship titles in Guilty Gears, Vampires, and Street Fighters alike, becoming one of the most highly decorated fighting game players of all time and ultimately sponsored by the people who make Grand Blue Fantasy, a wife-collecting game for the mobile telephone. And Obata? He returned to the mountains. He had won two Evos in a row, after all. He never stopped playing, though. In January of this year, in fact, he was in the team that won the annual Cooperation Cup, a team Third Strike tournament that attracts all those who are still, after 20 years, prepared to strike. Because Third Strike never leaves you. Once it's in your body, you can't get it out. For Capcom, getting it into people's bodies in the first place is what turned out to be the problem. Between the declining arcade industry, the game's lack of familiar faces and a diversifying home console market, Third Strike just never found the same audience that the previous game had. At the time of writing, the collected editions of Street Fighter II, even before all the turbos, remain the fourth best-selling Capcom game of all time. Street Fighter III doesn't even make the list. And it isn't just the spirit of the times, either. Street Fighter III's parry is warped, erratic magic but it's also really difficult. If you're fresh off the back of Street Fighter 2 and you miss Zangief and your opponent parries your heavy attack and combos you into oblivion, maybe that's not the kind of play experience that makes you go home and save up to buy a Dreamcast copy of Third Strike. And if that's how Street Fighter is for the next 5, 10 years, maybe you think it's time to move on from Street Fighter. By Third Strike, a lot of people felt like Street Fighter had left them behind. And in a world that had left Third Strike behind, what is the fate of moments like Evo Moment 37? Are they doomed to be just that? Moments shared by a small community of seasoned players of forgotten games? The fact is that once EVO Moment 37 started, it never stopped. It's happening right now. In dingy cabinets in arcades all over Japan. In arcade emulation systems in desktop PCs all over the world. In the hearts of everyone who has ever known anyone who has ever known anyone who was in that hall in 2004. Who has seen that shitty, massively compressed video on YouTube. Daigo Umehara is so, so many things, but he's not a superhero. What's always made him so inspiring is that he's just taken the time to learn to use his hands better than everyone else in the room. All the pieces are there, and now, thanks to him, thanks to this shitty videotape, they always will be. All you need is a little time, some guidance for your hands, the right room. Evo Moment 37 is quintessential because it's indelible. They call him Mr. Street Fighter because that day, like so many days, he gave Street Fighter to us. Sorry, I didn't die, I was just asleep. I moved and got a full-time job and all the other things. I'm still trying to figure out where this channel fits into my new weird life where I do sums for government money. I'll let you know when I do. If you liked this, you can tell a friend you liked it. In fact, you can tell me you liked it, because without noticing, I developed an addiction to that. While you're at it, tell YouTube, too. 
If you want to see the next one, you can subscribe to the channel. I think there's a bell. Click the bell. You can follow me on Twitter if you want live updates on how behind I am. In my endless quest for more of your attention, I've set up a curious cat you can ask me questions on. I'll do a Q&A video if I make it to a thousand subscribers or something. I don't know. Catch you later.